You too. You too. I want to thank Pastor David for the opportunity to continue our journey, my journey, through a deep and a very dark storm. I've discovered many things, learned many things, have journaled since uh, our son passed away. Not as much today, four years and eight months later as I did then, but still, still journal. And uh, at this point, I'm a little over 20 lessons. Now, you can take a deep breath. I'm not going to cover all of them in this hour. I'm going to highlight some. But I want to say up front that storms are a given. The only choice that, that you and I have is when they come is the choice of how we will respond. But they're going to come. We don't have much control. Really, we don't have much control over what happens to us. But I've learned to believe we have total control over how we respond to what happens to us. The message today will be about choice. When we face tremendous adversity, as many of you have faced, the size of the storm and the intensity really doesn't make that much difference. What matters is how we respond and where we go. The only choice, the only choice that enables God to work for good and for His glory, for the good of the individual and the right response in conforming them to the image of Christ, and for the good of others in a watching world who are perhaps encouraged and influenced by witnessing such response. And all of that redounds to the glory of God. There's only one place to look. That's here. In the last four years and eight months, so many times, I've let go of God. But He's never, not once, let go of me. I want to use the storm of, this literal storm of the disciples, because it really sets in context with the the fear and the, the struggle with faith and where to turn just like our personal storm has done for us. So I want you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. In verse 22. Now I'm going to read these few verses, four verses. And as I read it, I'm going to draw from Matthew's parallel account. He gives us some uh, little insight that Luke doesn't give us, and then I'm going to draw from Mark's account as well and and bring into uh, Luke's uh, rendering uh, some of the insight from Mark and try to give you the full picture uh, of what's taking place uh, in this storm on the Sea of Galilee. So listen as I read and and bring in uh, those other pieces. One day, one day, Mark tells us on that day, what day? On a day that Jesus had been teaching been teaching uh, the parable of the soils, the parable of mustard seed. He had done some miracles of healing, perhaps even raised the uh, 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 widow's son from the dead. It had been a great day of teaching. They had witnessed so much, really not just that day, but in the weeks and months that preceded uh, this event. And they were becoming, though not fully convinced, they were becoming more and more convinced that there is really something unusual about this man, Jesus. One day, He got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. Now, Matthew's account uh, is more in your face. Matthew says, he gave orders. He gave orders. He commanded them, get in the boat, go to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. Now, I'm not a fisherman. I don't care much for the water, and I've been fishing three times in my life, and I like to forget all of those. But I do know this. It's good when the boat is in the water. It's bad when water's in the boat. 
I know that. Water's in the boat. Not good. And they went and they woke him saying, Master, Master, we're perishing. Now, Mark adds this comment. Don't you care we are perishing? It was an early comment in my heart and mind and lingered for weeks and months. Don't you care? Where are you? When I need you the most, where are you? He woke and he rebuked the wind and the raging waves and they ceased and there was a calm. And he said to them, where is your faith? Now Mark adds, have you still no faith? In other words, of, in light of everything that I have said, everything that you have seen, everything that I have done, still, still. And they were afraid and they marveled, saying to one another, who is this? That he commands even the winds and the water and they obey him. Let me pray. Father, in these minutes, oh, please give clarity. Give clarity. To my mind, my heart is spoken word. Holy Spirit, fill and control. Holy Spirit, work on the soil in which the truth lands. Make it soft and pliable. Receiving the promises, the truths, the lessons. Give us the courage to take heart. And to look in the right direction to the right person when the storms of life come against us for they will Holy Spirit invites you into this place in this moment to work in my life and in the lives of these who listen in Jesus name I pray amen February 12th 2008 I was teaching across the sidewalk there in AP2 it was about 12 minutes after 6 I had about 75 folks in the class. I had just begun and security guard walked in, which was not unusual. Usually they were coming to adjust the thermostat. Uh, I always wondered why they came into any place that I was and came and adjusted the thermostat. I mean, really, they always do. I thought I'm either hot air or cold air, one or the other. They're always coming in. This time he didn't go to the thermostat. He walked over to the podium where I was standing. And he got just right next to me. And I, I was getting a little nervous and he said, your daughter's outside. She really needs to see you. So I apologized to the class and said, you know, I'll, I'll be back in just a minute, but obviously I have an emergency. Let me step outside. When I opened that door, my sweet daughter uttered, Daddy, Jeremy's dead. He's killed himself. Oh, man. I never realized that I'd be in the fiercest storm of my life. It would be the most serious test of my faith that I could ever imagine. Little would I dream that three years and eight months later, I'd be in the emergency room, and within hours, as the surgeon said, you're hanging by a thread, that I would have four emergency bypasses. Both of those storms still linger. Both of those storms, for me, have established a new normal in my life. Many of you understand that. We've all been through our storms. I want to take the disciples experience and I just want to uh, kind of talk out of where God has taken me over these months and the lessons that he's teaching me I want to do two things first of all I want to deal with two lies lies about storms and then I want to unpack three lessons out of many but three lessons from storms that I've learned let's first of all begin take your listening guide 
And let's begin with the two lies. Lie number one. These are lies. Untruths, false, not facts, wrong, unbiblical. But yet, in many places, both of these are lies that many of us have bought into, unfortunately, as I did. Lie number one, committed followers of Christ are exempt from storms. Committed followers of Christ are exempt from storms. Folks, we all face storms. As Pastor David said, we're either in one this morning, we just came out of one, or one's waiting for us outside the door, or maybe by a text while we're here. No one is exempt. Storms come to bad people. Storms come to evil people. Storms come to good people. Storms come to God's people. Storms come. Storms come. Where they come from, whether it's God or whether it's, uh, whether it's Satan or whether it's the, uh, as, uh, in, in our case, it was the bad decision uh, by a son and a brother whether it was a bad decision or whether it was a personal choice uh, that I made that was a bad choice or a sinful choice, they come. And what I've learned is the source of them is not near as important, nor is it near as important why they came. What really matters is how am I going to respond? What choice am I going to make? Because they are going to come. The disciples, I mean, look at the text. It says one day, verse 22, uh, he got into the boat and he said to, his, to them, let us go across. He gave orders. Why were they in that storm? Were they in that storm because they were disobedient to their Lord? No. They were in the storm because they were obeying God. Now, that's not always the case, but it's the case here. They were right in the center of where Jesus wanted them to be, and they faced the fiercest storm of their life. And I tell you, the storm has got to really be bad when you've got at least three professional fishermen on the boat, and they have to wake up a carpenter for help. (laughs) Bad storm. Bad storm. Committed followers of Christ are, are not exempt from difficulties. Never have been and, and, and never will be. Look on your listening guide. Look at, John, uh, look at the John uh, uh, 16 passage. John 16, 33. Now, in John 16, Jesus is in the upper room with his uh, disciples. He's been teaching his, uh, them really privately uh, for the last time in chapter 14, 15, 16, and really then into 17. 17 is, is really a prayer. And uh, so he's really ending in verse 33 some of his final words, if not his final words, to his immediate followers. He has told them repeatedly, I am going away. And they were distraught. They were troubled. They were full of grief and sorrow. How could this happen? Why why are you going away? And they just never did fully understand it at this point. And yet time and again, time and again, Jesus had promised to them, you're going to be okay. I'm going to send you at least 10 times in those few chapters, Jesus promised, I'm going to send you a comforter, the Holy Spirit. And he's just like me. But even better yet, he will not just be with you like I have been with you. He will be in you and he will permanently indwell you and he will provide you the encouragement, the strength, and the comfort you need for whatever storm you're going to face because they were going to face a tough storm. That's the context. And then he closes with these words. I have said these things to you that in me, remember where you look, in me you may have peace. In the world, you, the closest followers of Jesus, you might have tribulation, could have tribulation. That's in the reverse standard version. No, you will. That's a statement of fact. You will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. Folks, listen. Look at this second lie. Let me move on to the second lie. God never puts on us, or God never gives to us more than we can handle. I got to tell you, there were many times in those opening months that many well-intentioned believers said to me, you know, Jimmy, and I know their heart was right, uh, praying for you, but you just just need to know God's not going to put a more in you than you can handle. They lied. And that's a lie. God will do it all the time. Over and over and over again, God will put more on you and me than we can handle. 
Say, wait a minute, I thought, I thought Paul taught us in 1 Corinthians 10, 13 when he was talking about temptation that God will, never, uh, God will never let us be tempted beyond that which we are able, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape. And that's true. But I'm not talking this morning about temptation. I'm talking about storms. They're not mentioned in that passage. And, and uh, uh, by the way, he says in the temptation passage, just kind of P.S., yes, he will provide a way of escape, but you got to take it. Or even then, you could face more than you can handle. In fact, this same Paul, turn over to 2 Corinthians. Turn over to 2 Corinthians and find uh, chapter 1. Let me just show you one instance from the life of Paul who penned those same words that we often go to about God's not going to allow more to happen in your life than you can handle. Listen to Paul's own words in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction we experience in Asia. We're not told the specifics of the affliction. But it must have been extremely difficult because of what we read next. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength. This storm is so pervasive. This affliction is so difficult. These times are so hard. I don't know if we can make it. And then he adds that we despaired of life itself. And what the word despair there means is, and we don't see any way out. We are trapped in a storm, and there is no exit. That's how I felt. That's how many times we feel when we get into a fierce and an epic storm in our lives. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. Now, here's a lesson I'll come back to later. Why does God put more on us than we can handle like he did the Apostle Paul? But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God. On God. So, Gang, those are, those are two lies that we need to kind of wrestle to the ground. Any view of God, listen, any view of God that leaves storms out is an unbiblical view of God. God not only will allow them, sometimes he will send them right to your address. Now the lessons. Now the lessons. There, there are three. There are many, but I'm just going to pick three that I felt the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, spoke to my mind and heart about revealing. Listen, we need to, uh, we need to understand that there's a, you know, there's a, there's a significant difference in school and in life. In school, you take lessons and then they give you a test. You know life doesn't work that way. Life works in the reverse Life is you get a test. You determine whether or not you learn the lessons. It's a huge difference. Now, what are the lessons? Maybe, maybe sometimes though the real mistake, in thinking about this, the real mistake is to go through a storm and not to learn from it. That may be the height of foolishness. Lesson number one, storms inspect the validity of our faith. Storms inspect the validity of our faith. They examine the genuineness of our faith and they expose the object of our faith. Now, in 1 Peter 1 verses 6 and 7, Peter writes, in this you rejoice. He has just been speaking of the tremendous uh, 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 result of salvation is a guaranteed inheritance uh, forever in glory uh, with God. A promised inheritance for all in a relationship with Christ. So rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you may have been grieved, distressed by various trials. Why do these come, Peter? And by the way, do you think Peter knew about storms? Uh... I think Peter did. You know, Mike didn't put it up here, but I'm going to say this guy's Peter. He's in the boat. By the way, there was another storm some months later. Peter was in the boat. Peter was the leader of the disciples' band. Peter was the one who always spoke up. Peter was the one with the, uh, with the apostle with a uh, sandal-shaped mouth. I understand that. Just about every time he opened his mouth, he inserted his sandal. I mean, he was the one who said, no, 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 Lord. Everybody else may deny you. You can count on me. And before the cock crowed, three times he denied. 
He knew that tremendous night of tragedy and denial. And yet when we read these words, this is the same Peter who writes this in a couple of the verses that I'll share uh, 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 later on in the teaching. And Peter says, In this you rejoice, so that for a little while, if necessary, you may have been grieved by various trials. Why? So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that, perish, that perishes, though it is tested by fire. That's the same Peter who wrote this. He understood the storms. He understood the failure. He understood the forgiveness. He understood the help. Peter fully understood. You see, we all have faith. Jesus asked these disciples, where is your faith? He wasn't questioning if they had faith. We all have faith. If you ever go through, and I haven't in 10 months, and if I do, my wife will kill me. I haven't gone through a drive through of a fast food restaurant in more than 10 months. They miss my business. But stop and think about this. To go through a fast food drive through takes an enormous amount of faith. You drive up to a window, you drive up to a box, and you talk into a box. Hey, I want a double cheeseburger. Okay. And someone you don't know takes your order. And someone that you've never seen, you don't know if they've washed their hands in six months or in six years. You don't know. <laughs> and they make this burger, and they put it in a wrapper you cannot see. Okay? You go up to the window, and they take your money first. They're not foolish. <laughs> and then they put it in a sack in which you cannot see. And you and I drive away, and before we get out of the parking lot, we've got our hand in the sack grabbing those hot, fresh-smelling, wonderful killer fries. That takes faith. That takes faith. You ever uh, go to the doctor and get a prescription? That takes faith, especially in this environment. That takes faith. You go to a doctor that you probably don't know very well. They write a prescription out of prescription you cannot read. And then you take it to a pharmacist that you probably don't know, thinking they can read. And they fill it. And they put it in a bottle in which you cannot see. What do we do? We take it. That's faith. The issue is not faith. It's the object. It's the thick ice on which we stand. And one of the great lessons of this whole experience has been what it's done to my faith. Because you see, for many, many years as a student of Scripture, I had a faith but in many ways, it was too intellectual only. And many of you are like that, but more of you have this kind of a faith. I call it a good times faith. As long as you got the good times, as long as life's going the way you want it to go, then you got faith. Listen, gang, a faith that can't be tested shouldn't be trusted. And it takes the storms of life to prove the genuineness of our faith. And it's the object more than anything else that matters, in whom or in what are we going to trust? Is it going to be yourself? Is it going to be others? Is it going to be the circumstances? What's it going to be? A wish, a hope? What's the faith basis going to be? And storms test the validity of our faith. Shortly after I got the news, just minutes, that Jeremy had, was dead, I sent someone to get Linda. She was on property and I made my way upstairs, and, and I went down the concourse. I wanted to see our pastor, my pastor. I was in shock. And I got to the end of the concourse, and I was about to burst through the door, and I stopped and thought, I don't want to go through that door. I don't know who it was on the other side of that door, and I'm not ready to deal with some things. So I called David. He was in a meeting just down the hall, and I knew that. I didn't know if he'd answer the phone, but he did. And I don't remember what I said to him, just, I need you, help me. He made his way out, and I stood there. And a few minutes later, he called and said, where are you? I said, I'm standing in the concourse. Well, my office is over here. And he had gone this way. He never had a sense of direction like I do. Never had a sense of direction. <laughs> so we end up meeting 
up here in the, in the, in the uh, uh, center, and he gave me a big old bear hug, and then he put his hands on my shoulders, and he looked me in the eye. He said, Jimmy, you're fixing to find out if you really believe what you've been teaching all these years. I'll never forget that. He was right. And boy, it was a journey, and it's been a journey. The year after Jeremy passed away, my word for the year, some of you may remember, was, was doubt. And that's where I was. I was on thin ice. If I've been a fool, if I've been deceived, if I've been wrong. And through the death of our son, God has done more to solidify my faith in its genuineness than could have ever been done, no matter how much I studied or how many books I read. The crucible of pain brought me to a faith that has a depth that I never would have realized without the storm. Storms inspect the validity of your faith. Secondly, storms provide another valuable lesson. They invite the possibility of growth. You see, they're going to come, but are we going to respond to them in such a way that they allow us to grow and to develop? Now, let me get, let me get intensely personal. There are a few lessons where God is really changing my life. Let me share a few of them with you in terms of, of growth and development. Number one, I've already alluded to, I realized through the storm experience that I was too self-reliant, too self-sufficient, too proud, and too arrogant at times. That I relied on my strength, my ability, my ingenuity, my determination, my perseverance, all of that was mine. And up until this storm, it had gotten me through. But this one, was more than I could handle on my own. The second thing it taught me, it taught me that as much as I want to be and as much as I wish that I could be, I have very little control over things. That one really eats at me even today. This may surprise you, but I'm a control freak. Okay, and I have others in the room. Listen to me, we don't have much control over anything. Only God does. And only a fool would think that they are in charge instead of God. And I was a fool. The third thing I've learned is that I needed to be, pain brought a softening. It, 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 it brought, it, 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 it sandpapered some of the edge. The Lord knows I needed it, yes. And gave me a greater sensitivity and empathy for folks who are going through storms and through pain. I told my wife the other morning, we were walking, you know, I feel like at times I've turned from the ice man to the nice man. No response. I may have moved from minus five to two, but I've moved. I've moved. A greater empathy for others. Something else he's taught me is the role and the power of the Holy Spirit who lives us in us as his children. That this same Jesus and beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors that used to be with the disciples now lives in his children in the person of the Holy Spirit. And he alone can provide the strength and the encouragement and the hope and the power that you and I need to make it through the storms of life, however severe they may be however severely may be. Remember, God isn't at work producing the situation you want. He is at work in the situation producing the you he wants. And that matters more. Look at... Look at... Uh, uh, B, look at this quote by Alan Redpath. Storms invite the possibility of growth. There is nothing, nothing, no circumstance, no trouble, no testing that can ever touch me until first of all it has come past God and past Christ right through to me. If it has come that far, it has come with great purpose. 
Look on the next page. I have sprinkled in this listening guide seven or eight passages that for the last four years and eight months, God continued, draws me to many, but he, these are the core that he continues to take me back to uh, in his word to, to speak truth and hope and strength into my life. Romans 5, 3 to 5, not only that, but we rejoice. Now, Peter said we rejoice. Now, Paul uh, says we rejoice in the sufferings, the storms, knowing that the storms produce endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Listen, my, my hope factor has never been higher. And the reason for that is that God had to do some work in me and some character issues to create an integrity between things that were said and things that were done internally in my life that only storms could bring about. And that came as a result of the storms that brought a staying power, a dependency on God that produced a character that was more pleasing to God that creates in me a hope to go on regardless of the storm. Paul also writes in Romans 8, 28, and we know that those who love God, all things uh, work together for good. Paul didn't say all things are good. All things are not good. The death of our son was not good. The, the occurrence of cancer is not good. The breaking up of a home is not good. Those are not good and never will be. But listen, you and I, if we know Christ, we have a relationship with a God who is so wonderful, so powerful, so strong, so comforting, so encouraging, so able, so sovereign, that he can take even the most horrific thing that you and I would ever face in life and mix it all together with all of the attributes of himself and our cooperation. And as a result of that, at the end, you get an unbelievable life that's baked to perfection. Every time. Every time. And only God can do that. Only God. God can do that. Listen to Peter again. Beloved, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised at the fire trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happened to you. Listen, it may be, I'm not there fully yet, it may be, listen, storms doesn't mean God's picking on you, it means he really loves you. Listen, the presence of a storm never ever implies the absence of God, ever. He's there, maybe more than ever, in the midst of our storms. He's the God of all grace. Look at James, count it all joy. Now, have you picked up a theme here in the face of difficulty and trials and storms? Have you picked up a theme? Peter's mentioned it at least twice, maybe three times. Paul has mentioned it, and now James mentioned it, count it all joy. Joy. Not in the storm for the storm, but for what God can do with the right response to the storm. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet various tri trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing your faith produces steadfast. There's that staying power, endurance. And let it. Make the right choice. Let it. Let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Storms increase. The in it, it invite the possibility of growth. One more lesson. Let me close. Storms increase the intensity of our trust. I want you to look back at the text. I want you to look at verse 22 and notice. Don't miss this. When Jesus ordered those disciples, listen to what he said. Let us go across to the other side of the lake. You say, Jimmy, what's the point? Jesus gave them a command with a promise. Did Jesus say to them, hey guys, let's get in the boat, go out into the middle of the lake, face a storm, and drown? <laughs> no. Let's get into this storm. No. Did he know their storm was coming? I believe he did. But did he give them a command with a promise to get to the other side? He did. Sometimes I did, sometimes you may. I forget who God is and what he can do. He promised them, he gave them his word. We're going to get to the other side. And they didn't hold on to that. And there have been times in the last four years and eight months, it was hard for me to hold on to that. And there have been times I think I let go. But he didn't let go of me, ever. He held on to me. And may get through to the other side. You see, the most important thing, gang, is not the storm. 
that's around us. It's what's going on inside of us. And we come to that storm, we've got one of two choices. We can choose self-pity, and I've done that at times. We can choose bitterness, resentment, anger. We can choose denial. We can choose rebellion. All of those are an option, but they're all losers. Or we can choose acceptance. Not resignation, acceptance. That God is in charge. God is in control. God makes more mistakes. He wants to make me more like Christ. He wants to use me walking through a terrible time to be an encouragement to others. He wants to conform me to the image of Christ. And I can surrender. And I can submit. And I can accept. And I can be conformed. And I can be changed to be more like Jesus. Those are the two choices that face you and me every time a storm comes into our lives. Let me close with this. Storms are coming. They are a fact. Storms are going to change you as they have me. That's a fact. The only thing that's really up for choice is will the change be for better or for worse? That's a choice. And my word to you and reminder to me, in this season of storms, you make the right choice. Then God fulfills his promise to work all things together for good, for the individual, for the witness of others, and for his glory. And I'm encouraging you and reminding me, let's make the right response. Amen? Amen. 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 God so deserved that, and I'm sure glad I got in on it. Thank you. He's a good God. He deserved every, every bit of it. That's how great he is. Bow your heads with me. Would you do that? Here's how I'm going to close. I'm going to turn it to Pastor David. I couldn't share this kind of message and not give those of you, especially in the midst of storms, an opportunity to be prayed with and for. I got to tell you, not only have storms made me greater, more dependent on God, it made me see the importance of people praying for me and with me that I hadn't seen before. So I'm going to ask you to do this. Our team's going to sing, and some of our pastors and our prayer uh, team partners are going to be at the banners. If you're in a storm this morning and you need prayer, you don't have to share your name. You don't have to share details. You just want to be prayed with and prayed for. If you just slip into the nearest aisle and make your way here to the front of one of the pastors or the banner, give us a chance to pray with you and for you, and then you can go back to your seat. Okay? Team, when you begin to sing, I'm going to invite you to come and Pastor David to be the next voice you hear. Okay?